So firstly, welcome to Beyond the Title. I've interviewed many comedians through the years and I'm always fascinated to learn their comedy heroes. But with your Kurdish background, did this have an influence on your comedy education? Um, I would say it it did have... Uh, well, firstly, thanks for having me on. Secondly, yeah, no, I would say it did, but it, it added to it, not so much... Um, you know, it wasn't like my sole education into comedy, but it did add to it. Um, like often with um with a lot of Kurds, they use humor because that's the only sort of thing we have really, like to make best of the situation in in that part of the world. So, like when I tell any of my friends and family, like my Kurdish side, like, well, I don't find you funny, but like, well done for doing what you're doing, kind of thing. Um, so it it's always just it's it, it's quite funny in that respect. But um, I, when I was growing up, they my parents would get me to watch um, you know, like. Kurdish comedies and stuff like that, like bits of uh, bits of um, satire and stuff, which is very different to um, English comedy. But my main influences, I'd say, in in terms of uh, stand up, when I was younger, it was people like Eddie Murphy, um, uh, Russell Peters, Paul Chowdhury, um, and as I got older, I start I, I was I was a lot more into like Chris Rock and Bill Burr um Dave Chappelle at times um Kevin Bridges Kevin Bridges lo lo love Kevin Bridges as well um so yeah it sort of developed um but I feel like predominantly when I was younger it was those oh yeah and Adam Bloom Adam Bloom sorry Adam Bloom was I remember watching Adam Bloom on YouTube when YouTube was first a thing when I, in like 2006 watching Adam Bloom and I was just like oh wow this is incredible um so yeah that th th that's predominantly what um what influenced me in comedy? Cool. So, um, we've connected uh, through your management team, who we've had a lot of dealings with in the years, most notably when we were lucky enough to do a podcast with the great Mo Gilligan. In your import, in your opinion, how important has his rise to fame been in offering in offering a platform to comedians who perhaps haven't come through the conventional comedy channels? So, Mo, Mo I think I think a lot of people don't understand like. Um, how how long Mo was actually doing comedy for? I feel like a lot of people just assume like he he was one of these guys on Instagram that just banged out a few videos, and you know like he like an, almost like a YouTuber or a TikTok star that mm -hmm. tried his hand at stand up. Um, it, his story is one of um, I feel like great inspiration for a lot of people, especially comics from different backgrounds and I don't just mean that from like an ethnic perspective or like a race perspective but I think in particular like working class backgrounds as well I think it would I think in this country we sort of um we sort of dismiss the class issue a lot but in comedy it has a massive bearing on it and I feel like um he, he provided a lot of inspiration for a lot of working class comments regardless of their class I mean regardless of their race sorry so um it's, it's fantastic um he was pitched to every TV channel and every production company in this country, and all of them were like, mm, "I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not quite sure. Don't know if it. Don't know if it quite translates. Don't know if it does well. It sort of feels like a, um, you know, they they, they sort of thought it was like this. It was a, like a niche sort of bit of comedy, but obviously the videos, um, and the use of social media to display that talent showed people that." um the gatekeepers often do get it wrong <laughs> like and that um his sort of comedy was things that a lot of people can relate to um and i think it, it is important because it showed um like i said a lot of working class comics the fact that you don't need to go edinburgh and spend your life savings to go over there for a month um and just hope that somebody gives you a spot on a panel show you could sort of be the architect of your own destiny and go, do you know what? This is the stuff I want to create. And let me put it into, uh, let me put it in, uh, let me put it out there. Um, and I feel like a lot of people didn't really wake up to how important that was until COVID hit. And then they were like, oh, <laughs> he was ahead of the curve kind of thing. Like he, we should have been doing this since, since he's been doing it. Um, but yeah, it's been fantastic, and and I think it goes to show as well, like often in in this country, like you know that people um, 
think like a comic's got to be self-deprecating and almost you know like uh, almost ugly and <laughs> but like mo shows that you could be cool and fashionable and mm. and 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 that sort of stuff as well like it, it's i mean he's got he's got a modeling contract now do you know what i mean it's like it's like how many comics in this country it can be models do you know what i mean so it's it's mm. uh it's certainly shown us what's possible like sky is literally the limit like you can you can do whatever you want to in this day and age um as long as you put your mind to it. Yeah. Josh said you probably wouldn't get Alan Carr um, being offered a modeling contract. <laughs> yeah. No, but maybe like, a, maybe like a dental contract or something. Like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so we've got another mutual connection, the uh, formidable KG, the comedian, meeting him back yeah. in 2005, where he was known as Shadow. I always knew that he was going to be destined for bigger things, but like many people of your generation, he was inspired by rap and hip hop. I'd love to get a bit more of an insight into that world and why you think it's these communities that are so creative and how closely linked our culture and creativity. That's hilarious that you know KG. Like I was at his wedding like years ago. Yeah. Um ha, ha, do you know what? It's it's very interesting because um I think I think in particular with like sort of like the black comedy circuit, being cool and, and being in the know is very important. Like people people sort of don't like that sort of um loser mentality if that makes sense whereas i feel like <laughs> in british comedy in the mainstream it's sort of a lot more important to to be like the self-deprecating sort of oh i don't get girls i'm do you know what i mean it's like yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm sort of like i'm terrible with women i can't i can't i can't uh what's it I'm, I'm terrible at sports i can't do this whereas in um uh, on a black circuit, it was it was it was very different. It was like you had to go on with bags of energy. You had to be confident. You had to be like, I am the guy, right? And uh, when you look at a lot of the music as well, like things like hip hop, there's no there's not really self deprecating hip hop, is there? Do you know? <laughs> no, no rapper. Uh, no, I'm, I'm terrible with women, and I don't. And I, you know, I, I, I'm I'm just awful. Even if he's like ugliest fella in 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 the in the building he's still talking about how amazing he is with uh and and how great he is at getting money and do you know what i mean it's just yeah. it, it's that sort of thing and it and i think um with um with um the music it's so intertwined with comedy um in on that side of on that on that circuit um and if you look at like um the the recent uh, rise of certain comedians on that circuit it has come through the music if you look at like michael dapper it was um his character big shack he mm. done a fire in a booth and that went viral um there was another guy coyote ayume did a character called roll safe which the bbc then took on yeah uh, and that was like music based as well he done a fire in a booth as well with charlie slow yeah yeah oh, mo's uh, initial video that went viral was the different type of rappers mm. um, and then um, uh, you look at Munya Chihuahua all of these are really sort of like rap parodies and stuff that have like like, like led to it, um, it, it, it it going viral and I, and, I, and I suppose part of the reason for that is is similar to um, the music grime and rap uk rap and stuff they weren't really lauded by the mainstream so they had to go and make their own platforms in order for things to be shared in order for them to be successful like they got so good and they built these platforms up to such a level that they can't be ignored now to be featured on those platform social media you have to do some sort of music right it has to be some sort of so it has to be music adjacent or adjacent to the culture in a sense. They're not just going to put a stand up clip up there or they're not just going to put a comedy clip up there if it doesn't sort of relate to the culture in a way. So 
if you're thinking about it from a strategic point of view, how can you get on the GRM dailies, the I'm just Bates on, on Instagram or, you know, um, SBTV or uh, countless of these dozen meme pages that predominantly share music based things. The best way to get on there is to tap into that aspect of the culture with your comedy. And then it provides you a springboard. Once people see you on that platform, they're like, Oh, who's this person? And then they go and follow you from that. Mm. I hope that answered it well. Yeah, yeah perfect. <laughs> yeah, really good. Yeah. Um, so you're no stranger to the podcast format. Since 2021, you teamed up with the great Marcus Bronzy for the successful Ain't Got a Clue. In a crowded mm -hmm. market, what makes this podcast unique and how do you think the podcast format has expanded the platforms that new comedians can cultivate their craft? Uh, I think what makes it unique is the chemistry. Um, that's, that's the one thing that people often... Um, compliment us for and often like all of our like fans that say oh we just love the um, vibe that you two have together um but in terms of podcasts i feel like um it's very it's, it's a very useful tool in in the sense that um you can provide content for your fans at a much quicker level than you ever could as a comedian before if you think back to when you were younger maybe in like maybe if you even look back at like the 90s or the early 2000s or that rise of like comedians from like Live at the Apollo and that sort of stuff, you would get an hour from them if you were lucky once every three years. An hour, like you'd get an hour of material from them once every three years and you were happy with that, right? Whereas now, and this is the reason podcast tours are so much more successful than stand-ups actual tours now, you're seeing comedians sell out the O2 with their podcasts or sell out Wembley with their podcasts, but they can't do it with their stand-up. It's because now you're getting an hour and a half, three hours worth of content in your ear from your favorite comedian every week. Yeah. And it's um it, it it what it does is it also makes you feel like you're their friend, not only um not only just a fan, you feel like you're their friend because you're hearing about so much of their problems, you're you're spending a lot more time with them than you probably are with your own friends, if I'm being honest with you. Like a lot of us probably don't see one friend, that same friend for three hours a week all the time. Whereas you're listening to a certain comedian or comedians in your ear for, for three hours every week or whatever. And that provides such a, such a um, unique relationship with them. And it, and it makes you almost want them to win. You're, when, when you're listening, you, 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 you feel part of them and you want to be part of their journey and you want them to win. Um, and, and it, and yeah, and it creates a bond, like I think just being a normal stand up fan doesn't. And I, and I feel like there's going to be a lot of people who, especially comedians that started off doing stand up comedy, who, when they become successful with a podcast will stop doing comedy and just do the podcast because it, it's, it, it, it's an, another thing is I, I feel like nowadays people don't really care about stand-up in the way they did back in the day because they can see people they want to see people that are funny off the cuff rather than just rehearsed yeah. uh, set if they've if they've seen seen it once they don't want to see it again and if it almost feels like this is rehearsed or it feels like a performance people don't gravitate towards it like they used to um and the best comedians that you see often make it look like it's a stream of consciousness on stage rather than a rehearsed act. That's that's the most. That, I mean, certainly that's the ones I um, gravitated towards when I was younger. But um, I feel like nowadays, where people see their favorite podcaster, they they're talking and they're just funny off the cuff. They're like, "This is amazing. They are actually funny." That and and what people really gravitate towards now is, would this person be funny if I was sat with them in a pub or if I was sat with them? at home mm. and, and that's why podcasts are so popular yeah and um leads on nicely because we're in an age of 360 content now your stand-up debut stand-up special curd your enthusiasm received over a hundred thousand streams in your opinion how influential is social media and the streaming platforms to the direction of british comedy well i think it's um it's incredibly important that um what's it uh these these streaming platforms but i think i think the the, the <laughs> it's, it's 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 a funny one because 
I feel I was I was not the first one, but I was certainly like one of the first out of my peer group and stuff uh, in this country to just pop pop my special out there. And mm. before that, a lot of people were like, "Well, why are you putting it on YouTube? Why don't Why don't you put it on something else? Why don't you do it with like this platform or that platform or whatever?" And I was like, "I just want exposure. I just want I just want people to to see it because I was going to comedy clubs. People were like you were great, you were amazing." Like, but I was like, that. Why is that not translating into anything else? Why is that not translating into me getting an opportunity on TV, for example, or an opportunity on radio, or whatever it may be? Um, and anytime I'd speak to people and they'd be like, "What do you do?" and I said I was a comedian, they're like, "Are you on YouTube? Are you on? Are you on Instagram?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, I am, but I don't have anything on there." So that shifted my belief. And I was seeing people like Andrew Schultz in America and and their success, I was like okay, well, this is the way to go. So I filmed my special and you you see tons of people putting it out there now because it just means that you don't have to wait. You don't have to wait for somebody telling you you're ready. You don't have to wait for someone giving you an opportunity and going, um, or, or taking things out. I think that's the that's the biggest thing. The, there's a lot more creative freedom when when you're putting your stuff out on YouTube or Instagram. Um, there's, there's no lawyers at TV channels going you can't say this or you can't say that there's no one trying to shoehorn it into a certain scheduling time saying it needs to be 25 minutes because we need to put two adverts, adverts in between it and stuff like that so you can put out whatever you want you don't have to do an hour special you could do 25 minutes and call it a special these days it's completely up to you and it gives you that creative license and that creative freedom um and i think within british comedy i think for example i feel like there was a lot of communities certainly in recent years I'd, I'd probably say in the last 10 15 years like there was a lot of communities in this country that probably felt disenfranchised with comedy on tv i feel like we we, we bang on about diversity now but i feel like we were in a much better place in the 90s um than we were in the last 10 15 years certainly even from like a regional perspective like who who was the um mm. last peter k that we got from this country like do you know what i mean like northern comics or anything like that um so you 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 see a lot of comics from the northwest now that have got massive followings like have a word for example it's a it's a it's an incredibly huge podcast one of the biggest podcasts on patreon and their 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 their, their, their um success comes from the people of liverpool and the surrounding areas in the northwest predominantly but it's not just there like to be able to garner a level of success that they probably wouldn't have on TV because TV wouldn't have wouldn't have ever taken them on board. And, mm -hmm. and, and you're seeing now what they're able to do, fill out arenas, fill out massive theatres um, based upon the content that they put out. They're a production company unto themselves. They don't need to worry about other people because it's being funded by the fans and it's for the fans. Um, and I feel like with, with entertainment in general, I feel like that's the direction we're going. I feel like in comedy as well, that that's the direction we're going. We're either going along a self-funded model whereby it's either like Patreon or or what, what, what one of those kinds of services where people will pay for their favorite content from their favorite comedian or favorite entertainer or whatever, whether it's YouTube and people get free views. But I feel like the days of getting um one star that everybody knows are, are, are slowly dwindling away you're not gonna now back in the day you could sell out if you sold out Wembley everybody in the country knew who you were mm -hmm. now now you see tons of people sell out Wembley or the O2 or whatever and you're like who are they but it's because everybody now has a choice of what they want to watch and I feel like it's the same with with comedy you're you're you're, you're you may not be famous to everybody but you will have your own sort of audience and you'll be able to find them by putting out the stuff that you want to find and, and they'll gravitate towards it. And you end up getting, you you end up making a great living. Um, It's just that I don't think we're going to get that like overarching star, but you're going to get a lot more people that are at a level of success that, that, that you wouldn't have had previously, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Mm. We oh <laughs> <laughs>
Josh said we've had sort of a similar sort of theme with you know Josh's work and the podcast and everything mm-hmm. where you sort of you have sort of big stars on and people that you know would go on TV and and would be you know top of the panel on a, on a TV show they are online you put it out online and it just doesn't get the numbers that you expect it to because yeah. they're not as active in that field and like you say people know what they want now don't they which is yeah. it's like pirate radio but not pirate <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> exactly that I feel. I feel like uh, it, it's slowly dwindling away that that level of um, TV fame or, or the way TV can make you successful. Don't get me wrong, it still has a massive effect, but um, <laughs> reality TV has changed a lot. Even even I feel I feel like reality TV is the the reason why a lot of soap operas don't do well and stuff as well, um, because they like seeing the real life drama rather than scripted drama. It's like mm. what's funny, what yeah. like because they could see it unfold in between their eyes on Instagram and and Twitter and things like that, as opposed to just um on 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 EastEnders or Coronation Street where they're like this has been constructed and this has been made and it's it, I I don't know I don't know how wh- wh- what way you want to look at it whether it's a good thing or a bad thing but certainly uh, it it definitely has changed the landscape. Mm. So we uh, talk about your writing now. Um... So Britain can boast a, a pretty long and diverse heritage of uh, people who write and perform both in their own rights. People like the late, great Barry Cryer. Um, How do you think your vast writing credits have helped to cultivate your own comedy style? That's interesting. I mean, I, I wouldn't say writings... I mean, I think the one thing I would say is probably writings made me understand jokes a lot better. Right, writing for other people mm. has made me understand like the, the mechanisms of joke writing and stuff, and 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 how important tone and voice is, uh, in terms of it. Like what I, what I do enjoy about writing for other people or writing on a TV show is there's certain stuff that I know perhaps wouldn't work if I said it, but it would it would 100 percent work if somebody else said it. Mm. It's just just down to the you know like even even the, the way i look and my where, where i'm at in my life and that sort of stuff that somebody else would would um would be successful with that joke and i wouldn't um and i feel like it's always um it's always I've, it's always quite fun to be able to give yourself a challenge and i think what i realized most when i was writing is um as long as the joke was funny and people laughed at it i didn't mind not getting a credit for it yeah it was just it was just the ability like to see it do well that made me go yeah that's it (laughs) yeah that's yeah so are are you have i got news for you that's you've written for i did uh, well i think i i've done i think i've done a couple episodes on there but like uh charlie brooker league of their own um so i've done a few Projects with Charlie Brooker, a couple on Netflix, and I think a few of them BBC Two. Um, I'm doing um, things for Big Brother at the moment. Yeah, um, written on like voiceovers for like chunks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like loads of other people. So, do your jokes sort of expire then? Because Josh has sort of asked about how you sort of ensure that you keep your material up to date. Do you have jokes that you can just change, like? As part of well, the when you're writing for a TV, when, when you're writing for TV, they give you very specific sort of parameters. They're like, we want jokes about this, we want jokes about that. So it's not necessarily an expiry date. It's just jokes on that subject matter. So if the subject matter is topical, then of course it's it's going to expire by virtue of it being topical. Yeah. But um, it's it's even stuff like when you're writing for somebody on a panel show, uh, like for example on League of Their Own or whatever when you're writing on it for anybody on that or um, I was working on the Red Naps Big Night Out and you had like Tom Davis and you know like if if a guest like Jimmy Carr's coming on and he's 
giving it to Tom or whatever, like you giving a couple lines or having a having a few lines ready for Tom to give back to to Jimmy because he has the relationship with him, whereas I don't. Yeah. He can he can say certain things that I can't. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's it's imagine imagine you being able to get away with saying whatever you want to <laughs> your favorite yeah, comedian yeah. or whatever <laughs> without actually doing it yourself. But it's it's that sort of thing. That's the probably the best example I can give about like things that you know you can't say but somebody else can. Yeah. You mentioned a league of their own there. Josh was going to ask about that and how difficult that is to write when there's so many sort of games and events and and the show can go in so many different directions. How it how difficult is that to write for? Like you say, you well, just... I mean, it's it's more so a collaborative effort. I feel like um, it's not just like the, the guys that they get on are quite funny anyway. I I feel like they 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 they've got um, they've certainly got um, funny bones or they 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 know how to perform jokes yeah. give it to them um and it's mainly about sort of helping them expand the stories that they have when they're asked about certain things so if per- perhaps they're asked about if if, a, if there's a story about football contracts for example or like you know like the ones going on in saudi arabia yeah. and they're like did you have any big money contracts that were offered to you and if they have like a story surrounding that like a time where they went into the chairman's office and asked for more money or something like that you can you hear that story and you're like, all right, here's how we make it funny. Or here's where you put the gags in. Mm. Um, if yeah. there's stories about like, you know, there's a player that's had a spat with a manager or whatever. You're like, did you have any dressing room spats? And then they, nine times out of 10, they do have a story about all of these issues. So then you, or they have like a couple and you're like, well, this is where it goes. These are where the beats go. And that's where they're like, oh yeah, okay, great. That's funny. And because the story is theirs, you're just helping them to tell the story. It's it's not like it's not just necessarily me going and say this. Yeah. Like yeah. because that'd be hard. It's it's when you're writing for other people, it's it's about finding their their voice and what makes them funny and what their sort of character is on that show as well. Like what yeah. sort of role they play. And and when you when you when they tell their stories, it's easier to sort of like gauge that and be able to to help them flesh it out. Yeah. I assume you can see that. Just say, I don't think you have to do that for someone like Razor Brother because he's just a bit loose. Just let him go. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, I mean, I've, I've never had a pleasure of meeting him, but I, I know certain other writers have. They they go into every dressing room. Like depends what writer you are. Everybody gets a gets a bit of um help when they need it and when they ask for it. But yeah, I mean, I suppose Razor Ruddock doesn't need much. Help. <laughs> um, so the Edinburgh Fringe hasn't long finished. Um, that reminds remains a rite of passage for any budding up and coming comedian. Why do you think the festival is such a significant stepping stone for many comedians? I don't I don't I necessarily think it is a right of passage these days to be honest with you. Um I I always find it funny when <laughs> people are like, oh Edinburgh's so white or Edinburgh's so like middle class and whatever. And you're like, yeah, well, of course it is, because the audience that goes there are. Yeah. That's what the audience is. So by virtue that you're gonna get the people that are playing towards that, like the the, the reviewers that are going there or that. Like nobody ever complains that wireless festival is not more middle class. Do you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's, it's sort of one of those things where it, back in the day, I feel like it was quite rebellious. I feel like it was a fringe festival. It was on the fringes. It was where people experimented and tried out things. And I feel like when, when the festival first started and certainly in years gone by, it was, it was a rebellious, it had a rebellious nature to it. And there was a spirit about it that was, that was sort of anarchic. Whereas I feel like nowadays it's become a lot more rigid in its structures and stuff. And don't get me wrong. There's not a lot of places where you could perform an hour every day, or you can, (laughs) you can, you you can see like as many shows as you want within that area. But I feel like in this day and age and with the importance of online, 
I don't necessarily think it's the place to go and make or break your career. Even if you see in like recent years, the people that have been doing really well and selling out shows have often had like a, a bit of online fame anyway. Like you look at the people that are like selling out shows, they've got an online following and you're like, oh, wow, okay. Because at the end of the day, people would rather take a punt on someone that they've seen online and they found funny rather than just believing a review because let's face it, normal people don't really care about reviews. I don't know about you lot, but I've never sort of like gone through reviews and gone, that's the, that's the film I'm going to watch or that's the that's a comedian I'm going to watch. It's always based off a clip or something you've seen uh, that sort of like informs your your choices. Um, and I feel like the, the model in Edinburgh for a, a lot of acts is just not sustainable. It is very expensive to go up there you see like house prices, especially, I mean, like rental prices, especially to stay up there for the month is quite expensive. Uh, not quite expensive, very expensive. Um, and a lot of people don't have five to 10 grand to take a show up there by themselves, which mm. is often why you do get like, like, the, you know, the, 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 um, you get the, um, the, the criticisms you do about Edinburgh because a lot of working class people or a lot of people from, I think back, different ethnic backgrounds can't necessarily afford to spend 10 grand on a jolly up. Yeah. <laughs> During yeah. the summer. Well, we've, we've heard of people just from yeah. doing this that have, you know, it's, it's the end of their comedy career. I think everyone looks at it as like, it's a, it can be, give you a big break. But we, we've heard of people that, you know, they, they left their job, they blew all their money on Edinburgh. They've gone yeah. up there, say for a month to try and push, push their show. It's not gone anywhere. And then it's well, that's done. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and 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 that's the side a lot of people don't talk about. Where they're like, "Oh yeah, the Fringe Festival is amazing, this, that, the other." But there's there's a side people don't talk about, and I and I think it is important to highlight that. Um, don't get me wrong; it's amazing for a certain group of people and whatever. But I, I for example, I had mates that never came to see me in Edinburgh because when they checked out how long, how what's it, hotel prices, they were like, "I say I could go to IB for for a week for the price I'd be spending for travel and." An accommodation yeah and you're for, good you're not ib for good <laughs> yeah but but i was like mate go to ib for do you know what i mean rather yeah, than yeah. Come to like rainy edinburgh like don't get me wrong edinburgh is a beautiful city but if if you're given, yeah. you're given the choice of like 30 degree heat and a beach and mm -hmm. do you know what i mean like mm -hmm. I, I know which one i'm gonna choose rather than cobbled streets and hills but um <laughs> it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not as good. There's not as many access to hookers in uh, Edinburgh either. So. <laughs> I don't know about that, but um, no, no yeah, comment. It, no, it, it's um, but yeah, that. But I feel I feel like that that aspect of it, people don't sort of realize, and I feel like in this day and age, there are so many different ways to sort of make it that it is almost an outdated sort of thing. I mean, people still give out paper flyers over there, which like, when was the last time you took a paper flyer in any other aspect of life and was like, yeah, I'll go there. <laughs> it's it's sort of, it's great for us. For It is great at what it does for certain people. And, and, and what people have to remember is it's an arts festival. It's not necessarily just a comedy festival, even though like lots of comedians go. And I remember Paul Chowdhury telling me, he was like, if if you asked a businessman to invest in you and you ask them for 10 grand to go to Edinburgh, they're like, are you going to be the only comic there? They were like, no, there's going to be like thousands of them. They look at you like a weirdo. They're like, well, why are you going there? And it's like, often if, if it's like, if you're trying to set up like a, I don't know, like a barber shop, for example, on a, on a street or like a hamburger shop, you're not going to go on a street where there's like five hamburger shops or six hamburger shops there, are you? No. You're going to go somewhere where it is like none and you're going to be like, hey, have you seen my hamburgers? And they're like, oh, well, yeah, come on, I'm going to come through. And I feel like um, if you're going up there, it's, there's so much choice that if you don't already have something backing you, it is hard to be seen, especially on the paid fringe. The free fringe is a bit different. I feel like with a free fringe, you can be a bit more experimental because there's less... You're, you're taking less of a risk obviously you're still paying for like your accommodation and stuff like that but you're not paying necessarily for pr or, or you're not paying for a room or whatever and it's pay what you want when people come and see you um but certainly i feel like if you spent if you had five to ten grand to spend you'd probably get a lot further 
either setting up a podcast and paying somebody to produce it really well for you for a certain amount of time, or you'd get further on creating a web series or creating like filming a stand-up special or something. I feel like that money would be better spent and, and wiser to spend elsewhere in this day and age. Back in the day, there were, Edinburgh was the only place because TV were the only people that could film stuff for you. You didn't have access to 4K cameras. You didn't have access to condenser microphones and <laughs> and the things that we do today. There was no such thing as YouTube. You couldn't just put it out there. So it was important for you to, to be seen by certain people in the industry that could then go and put you in the necessary places. Whereas now I'm like, it's, 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 it's nice to do. It's great. It's an experience, but certainly I don't think if you don't have the money, it's, it, it's not worth 10 grand worth and, and the debt and, and the bankruptcy for certain people or like the loss of a dream. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's put us right off going now. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I feel I feel like going oh. as punters is is great. Going as custom, uh, going to watch and as a spectator, like I said, it can be it can be amazing. But again, it's still expensive to go there just yeah, to yeah. watch as well. So th yeah. there's that aspect of it as well. That's why, like, when they talk about diverse audiences, I'm like, well, none of my mates are going there anyway. Like. Mm. And so, like paying two times rent. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What's the point? Get it on the internet. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Your upcoming tour, Curb Mentality, sounds interesting. What can we expect? It's Curd Immunity. Yeah, uh, Curd Immunity. Um, yeah. All of my... um, I, I, just, I just put like a, a pun title in there because the British love puns, don't we? Uh, but um, yeah. I just... It's going to be very similar to things that you see from me already, a bit of political commentary, but not in like overtly, you know, like, oh, my God, the Republicans and a Democrat, nothing like that. But it's just like you you can expect a lot of like the same sort of stuff that I usually do in terms of like observations, uh, comment, uh, social commentary and that sort of stuff. Like the like, what we've been through the last couple of years um, or the last year or so, sorry. Um, and just genuinely funny, generally funny stuff, man. That's what I try and do. I don't necessarily have like a theme or a lot of people have like themes and stuff. This is a show about whatever, whatever happened to me. It's nothing like that. It's just me being funny for an hour, making observations and stuff. So, yeah. Where are you going? Where are you going? All over. Where am I going? I am going to Birmingham, Manchester, Brighton, Bristol, um, West Cliff on Sea, Newcastle, <laughs> Glasgow. Sheffield, um, yeah, I think that's it. and London, obviously, yeah. So, oh. um, Leicester as well. Leicester can't forget Leicester. How important do you think Live at the Apollo was for pushing your career forward in that direction? Um, I feel like it was quite important in in the sense that it's one of those things that's like people still know and respect where they go, oh, you've done Live at the Apollo. Oh, you must be good then, rather than, oh, you should try and get on Live at the Apollo. And it's like, no, I've done it twice. And they're like, oh, wow, like you must be you must be actually quite good. Um, and I feel like the clips that come from the show really resonate with people, and that's what's helped me. It's not so much people, don't get me wrong, when people are watching it, I get like a certain amount of followers and stuff from it every time people watch it. But it's more so the uh, clips that go um viral from it that um helped me out a lot as well because it's it's weird it's just like people trust it do you know what i mean they they know that backdrop they when they see you on it they're like oh yeah oh wow like um and yeah it has been quite important i'd say anybody that says it it didn't do anything for them for their career is either lying or they probably was shit on it <laughs> <laughs> otherwise <laughs> it, it, yeah. it, it it does it does a lot for you i mean it so it doesn't do what it used to do i think like people used to be able to sell out a national tour from appearing on it once but certainly it still does have a have an effect mm. you're not going to name any names please, uh, people who shit no, no, no. <laughs> um mm. 
looking back at your career, what's your proudest achievement? Oh, what is my proudest achievement? Um, I would have said live the Apollo, but I, I the first time I did it, I think that was one of the proudest achievements I had. But also doing five nights at the Leicester Square Theatre. I feel like that was um, that was pretty special. It's such a great venue. Um, and the fact that people just came out to see me, I was like, oh, wow, this is it's mental. I think it's got to be those two, really. It's like, th those two are probably my proudest achievements. Josh said, have you done the Museum of Comedy? Owned by the same people as Leicester Square Theatre. Yeah, I've done a preview there once. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Um, so last question. What's next for Keiko? What's next? Um, do you know what? <laughs> it's a very funny question. I mean, right now my focus is the tour. After the tour, who knows? Um, I do sort of want to focus on just creating a lot, creating a lot more content next year feel like uh i just want to have fun with what i'm making online and on youtube uh, i really want to give that a bit more focus and it might mean stepping a little bit away from stand up for a bit just because i feel like that to give those things the respect it deserves you need to sort of like go gung ho on it and and go all in so um i really just want to like create what i want to create and put it out there for people uh rather than wait for anybody else to try and come along and and help me do it right because that could, you could be waiting forever um so i sort of want to just um like i did with stand up take matters into my own hands and just start making stuff that i want to make cool that's it that's all we got for you thanks very much oh thank you thanks for having me uh, we really appreciate it <laughs> Oh. We'll let you know when it's going to go out. Um, it's going to be as part of um, Josh is doing a comedy series in October. So it'll be sometime in October. Okay, uh, wonderful. Yeah, we'll let you know anyway. We'll be in touch. Wonderful. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I hope I hope this was everything you <laughs> thought it'd be. <laughs> oh, yeah. Brilliant. Hey. Okay, um, Thanks very much. Have a great day, guys. Hopefully Thank you're you. done. All Thanks, right. Mate. See you later. Hey. Bye.